Josh, are you, do you still have finals? Yeah. Even as a senior? I have one final. One final. Because some schools, seniors don't have finals. Well, some of my friends don't have finals. Really? And uh, how about Arcadia High School? Finals? Yeah. Are you finished? No. No? One more week? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Poly Pomona is in week 10, right Austin? You get any sleep? Yeah. Yeah? My daughter stayed up till 2 a.m. I think on Thursday night. Yes. It's not even finals yet. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of this. Because quarter system is so hard. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, really, I, was, uh, I wanted to share about this passage of Revelation because I just got back from Japan on uh, Wednesday. Anybody been to Tokyo? Japan. You been to Japan? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, to uh, Japan itself and Tokyo is just amazing. It's the largest urban area in the world. 36 million people live in the greater Tokyo area. So it counts, the, the, uh, it's divided into wards. There's Tokyo area and then also Yokohama, which is basically the, the suburb of Tokyo, <coughs> is the second largest city in Japan. So if you put it together, it's just massive. And I was there. Uh, partly to visit uh, Japanese um, Caltech scholars that, were, that we had taught English to. And so that was fun to uh, and stay with families. And I was there with my daughter, who was 18, kind of as a graduation trip to enjoy uh, some special time. And uh, it's just, yeah, so when we were there, I was amazed at the, uh, even though Japan is pretty monocultural, and just about everybody you meet is Japanese, but uh, Tokyo area has become much more global and diverse, and so uh, you know, we uh, we want to know what God is up to uh, in the cities, because actually the population of Japan is decreasing pretty fast, but the population of Tokyo is increasing. So people are moving from the from the city uh, from the countryside to the cities, and, and Tokyo is becoming more global. Uh, it's going to host the Olympics in 2020, so we saw a lot of that already. The, the signs of that, and also uh, people were speaking uh, English a lot better than I was in the past. I haven't been to Japan since 2010, I think, or 2011, and so a lot of people were speaking English, whereas in the past I, I noticed that in Japan, even if people could speak English, they weren't very confident, you know, so, so uh, they would just kind of bow to you and bow and be polite, but there was a lot of uh, interesting, or more dialogue in English. Uh, so, the passage is uh, from Revelation 22, uh, verses 1 to 5. So, the final chapter of the Bible. And so, uh, there in your program, but I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding eat its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for its power. We pray that we will be able to hear your word this morning and learn from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so it's not common to, uh, to share from Revelation, so you kind of wonder why you don't usually hear uh, pastors uh, teaching or sharing from Revelation. And it's interesting because uh, it, 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 a lot of it is exciting and it has a kind of the uh, uh, conflict and uh, excitement and a lot of signs and wonders. And so part of it is it's really hard to understand. And uh, so my kids, uh, probably five or six years ago during our, we were having uh, Sunday night devotions together. And you know, I would choose a, a book uh, from the New Testament and we'd go through it. But at one point I said to my kids, what do you want to study you know, as a family? And unanimously they chose Revelation. So I said, oh, that's interesting. So we really had to dive into it. As a family. One of the things that helps in understanding Revelation, uh, Revelation 1, at the beginning of it, the introduction, 
it says in Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear uh, and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So one, one pastor that I, I know who was brave enough to preach about Revelation basically said, uh, we are blessed if we read Revelation, we're blessed if we hear the words, but it doesn't say we need to understand Revelation. So that's kind of comforting. Uh, just by reading the word and uh, reading Revelation and hearing, uh, we'll be blessed. So we don't, that's one of the introductions, is that we don't have to understand everything in Revelation. In fact, a lot of theologians have debated you know, what everything means. You know, the, the lampshades and the candles and all the, the, uh, the, the vision. So that's one thing that's helped uh, me is, is that we are blessed if we read it. Um, and it is the final book of the Bible, uh, chronologically and physically in the Bible. It's the, in fact, we're looking at the final chapter of the Bible. So that's meaningful because, of course, um, very clearly in Scripture it says we should not add to the Bible. So uh, other uh, religions, other uh, uh, beliefs add on to the Bible. There's something else. But this is the final, final word of God. And this is it. And so it's important. Uh, in fact, Revelation 22 is the last chapter, uh, the last book of the Bible. Uh, and most scholars believe it was written by the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. So um, that, that's important as well. Um, and so significant. And Revelation, usually, when you do hear it uh, preached on, it's usually Revelation chapters 2 and 3, where it talks about uh, the seven churches of Asia. And they're, uh, each of them has issues, and we can learn from those issues. But um, when we get to the beginning of chapter 4, it's the, the final uh, actions and the visions of what will happen at the end of the age. And I love uh, Revelation 7-9, so I talk about that a lot when we talk about international students and international people because it says clearly in Revelation 9, uh, which I'll read, And this I looked before me as a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and, and in front of the Lamb. So this is a big encouragement. It means there will be worshipers from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so that's why I love worshiping God in every language, in uh, Hindi, in Indonesian, Teriyakasi Tuan. So I love that because God understands every language. And so, uh, so it's very exciting, and we know that's what will happen at the end of time. Every people group, we say, or ethnic group, there will be worshipers at the throne. And then uh, chapter 21, a uh, big theme in Revelation is that the new Jerusalem this new, this new city that will contain all of the redeemed. And uh, so it's introduced in chapter 21, but then chapter 22 shows us what it looks like inside the city. And uh, we look at this, this uh, when what is written, it's incredible because uh, the angel is showing John <coughs> this, this, this vision of what the future will look like. And so it talks about not countryside, but, but a city. And, uh, you know, I'm doing my PhD right now in something called international development, which basically is addressing uh, the problems of the world. You know, how do you develop societies that have needs, that have poverty or illiteracy or uh, human trafficking? And ultimately, it comes down to broken relationships. So broken relationship with God, broken relationship with each other. And so that's one of the things I, I really picked up on this is that... Um, the Bible is about relationship with God and relationship with each other. And so what is needed, and we see at the end, is that there will be a restoration of the relationships. And so the vision of John uh, talks about, uh, in verse uh, 20, uh, chapter 22, verse 2, through the middle of the, uh, the street of the city, on either side of the river, is the tree of life. And so that reminds us of the beginning of Genesis. So three times in Genesis, it mentions... Uh, the tree of life, and that was the when sin happened. It was that was you know, in the Garden of Eden, Eden, and designed a broken relationship with God from the very beginning. And then, but many don't realize that that um, the tree of life is mentioned three times in Revelation as well. So this is a restoration. Uh, so because of the fall, access to the tree of life was lost. But here in the 22nd chapter of Revelation, right at the beginning, at the end. Uh, access to the tree of life is restored. And so that's exciting. And the tree is huge. It's on both sides of the river. And then the water of life that makes up the river is also something that we 
we have uh, quite a bit of, of uh, knowledge about. This is the living water. So, so this is the uh, women of the well in John 4. Uh, so John is also writing about that when, when a woman is talking about physical water, but Jesus is talking about living water, which is this, this uh, eternal life that leaves us thirsty no more. So again, this is mentioned here, this river uh, that is here um, is, is also important. And, uh, but notice that Revelation 22 at the end it says, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So this is restoration of, of relationship. And isn't that needed right now? There's so much conflict in the world and broken relationship when people come together. And so what is, what, how do we heal uh, relationships? Uh, it's, it's by doing what Jesus did and spending time together. So right now, for instance, it's the, the month of Ramadan, fasting for Muslims, right? And so in uh, many countries of the world, when you, uh, at the mosque, there is just one type of, of person. There's many mosques or neighborhoods. But the mosque, the mosque in Southern California, so, uh, and I was just, last night, there was a big event at the mosque in San Gabriel, uh, inviting politicians and law enforcement and kind of the community together for iftar, the breaking the fast. And, uh, and so you look at, you talk to people there, and so many different people groups are there. So on my right was a guy, uh, and he said, I said, what's your name? He said, Mustafa. And I said, where are you from? Uh, uh, and he said he was from Sudan. So African country, he was a perfect college professor. Across the table, uh, there was a guy from Nigeria. On my left was a guy from Sri Lanka. Uh, across the table, there was an Indian, a Pakistani, and a guy from Bangladesh. So those countries have a little, have some issues sometimes, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. But at the mosque, uh, they, there was a relationship, and I could have a relationship with them. And so that's one thing I enjoy about uh, cities is you have people coming together from many, many different uh, cultures and different groups, only in the cities. And Tokyo, uh, it's a little bit crazy, but when I, uh, because I'm so aware of different cultures, and uh, so we would meet people who were on tours, and uh, we were hiking, one, at one point we were hiking, my daughter and I were in Kyoto, we were hiking up the hill uh, to a place that, that has monkeys, and they're kind of wild, Anybody been to Kyoto? Have you been to Kyoto? No? Anyway, it's kind of the ancient capital, one of the ancient capitals of uh, Japan. So there's a place where you hike about uh, 20 minutes uphill and you get to the, uh, to the, to the top of a hill and there are about 140 Japanese monkeys running around. And you can feed them, but the funny thing is the people go into a, into, into a cage and the monkeys are kind of outside and they reach out and you feed them apples or peanuts or something like that. And um, uh, so it's really cool because, and there's another place in Japan, and it, did you go to Nara? Really ancient capital, but that's a place where you can, where they're uh, in the whole uh, area, uh, most of the city, uh, there are deer running around, like a thousand something deer. And, um, and you can buy deer crackers and you can feed them. And so, so usually, you know, in, in, Many uh, U.S. you can't feed, feed, it says don't feed the deer or touch them, but actually these deer are really friendly, kind of sometimes overly friendly. And so, it, it, yeah, it's kind of scary because... <laughs> My friend's arm got bit by a deer there. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, so they're a little bit aggressive sometimes because it... Uh, and so actually I, in my pocket I had uh, like the maps and everything uh, wrapped up and then like this in my pocket. And at one point, um, the deer grabbed it. Like this, I, I learned later they like paper, and so the deer grabbed it, and I was trying to. I really needed the map, and so uh, so I was in a tug of war with the deer, and then my daughter came up, and she had the food, and so she tried to get get the uh, you know distracted or you know, and eventually it traded. It took the cracker and dropped the map. The map. So it was uh, yeah, but we found out later that um, that um, have you heard this? They if you if, uh, they'll bow. And so basically my daughter would go like this, and the deer would go like this. That's how they ask for food. Yeah, yeah. So, and then she would give them. So that would, and that calmed them down too. Because some of them, if you didn't give them the food, they would kind of bump you from behind. I didn't see any, but yeah, they said like last year, 162 people were injured by the deer. So you couldn't do that in the U.S. because there would be lawsuits. 
and eventually, after a while, we learned, you know, we kind of would take the crackers quickly, because they would buy them, and then um, we, we would run, kind of walk off quickly, and we'd find deer that were peaceful, that were kind of sitting, or that were not the male ones with the horns, the antlers, and we'd feed them. Anyway, where was I? Oh, so, so these places, there are a lot, of, a lot of tourists. And so uh, walking up to the monkey park, uh, we were sitting down and resting, and a couple sat next to us, and I looked at them and I said, uh, "Are you?" I usually guess, which is which kind of get my daughter kind of rolled her eyes. But I said, "Are you? Are you?" I think I said, "Are you from uh, Egypt?" And uh, I said, "No, no." And then I said, "Are you from uh, Armenia?" I said, "No." And then I, then I said, "Slovenia, Slovak." You know, they kept. So I was really striking out. So my daughter was so embarrassed, and so I finally, I, I said, "I give up." Uh, what does your country start with? They said, M. So I said, Mauritius. And I said, Montenegro. And uh, they said, no. And then I, they said, uh, anyway, so they're from Macedonia. Yeah, so, so small, anybody heard of Macedonia? Small country, about two million people. And uh, anyway, so they're very friendly and, and uh, they were Christians. I knew that Macedonia is kind of an Orthodox Christian uh, culture. And uh, that was pretty cool, you know, I'd never met anybody from Macedonia, but I met them in Japan, in, in the city. Uh, and then there were a lot of Indians there on tours. Uh, the number one uh, country I saw was China, tons of Chinese tourists. Uh, and and uh, anyway, so uh, very, very, and then the workers at, at McDonald's, we spent a lot of time at McDonald's. So I, I never went to McDonald's here, but uh, in Japan, this is your, your hint, but, in pretty much every city, um, there are a lot of McDonald's, and you go in there, and uh, and you buy like you buy like you buy small fries and a small milkshake, and it was tiny, like those French fries. It was only like ten French fries, the small size. American small was pretty big, and then milkshake was, uh, was about that big. So everything. That, so I lost two pound, uh, three pounds in one week in Japan. <laughs> the portion was so small. But anyway, um, so you go into McDonald's. And uh, there's a huge seating area, so you kind of walk upstairs, and there, sometimes there's a basement, upper level, and people are just hanging out because the Wi-Fi is really fast and has air conditioning. So we spent time there, kind of resting, waiting to meet people. Anyway, so the McDonald's workers were off international. So one guy I looked at, and I said, "Are you from Delhi?" I thought he was Indian, and he said, "No, no, no." no. He said, "I'm Nepali, from Nepal." So it was interesting. So. Uh, where was oh so this so globalization means that people are coming together in cities and so in the in the mosque and Tokyo you see people from different cultures and it's easy to ignore people and uh, but I'm kind of overly interested in people and so uh, the the deal is that we can have because of globalization because of urbanization. People can have a relationship with one another in a way that was never possible in the past, and this is a fulfillment of Revelation. Because again, uh, when it talks about the healing of the nations, it's taught nations are people groups, and there's a lot of conflict between different people groups within countries, and uh, and so this is this vision that John has that's so exciting is at the end, end of time uh, there will be a healing of the nations, and so. Uh, so that's, that's the good news, that's really the gospel message. There was broken relationship with God in the Garden of Eden, uh, and at the end there's a rest, restored relationship with God. And we can have restored relationship with God right now. So that's the beauty of the gospel, that's the good news. Uh, but we see at the end uh, that uh, we, can, we, will, we will definitely have restored relationships. And that's why I love being in the mosque during iftar, the, the, the meal, because it's all about relationship. And it's a great chance to have a relationship. Uh, Tim Keller of uh, uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York, he writes, the gospel then is not just about individual happiness and fulfillment, it's not just about us, it's not about a wonderful plan, not just about a wonderful plan for my life, but it's about a wonderful plan for the world. It's about the coming of God's kingdom to renew all things. And that's what Revelation is about. Uh, and then John talks about uh, Revelation 22, 3 to 5, the rest of this passage. Uh, he's talking about kind of our role. He says, no longer will there be any curse, uh, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. So that means 
God the King, kingdom of God is in the city. And it says that his servants uh, will serve him uh, in the city. So the throne is in the city, which means that God is the king over the city, and his servants will be in the city. And uh, the, this, this vision ends in uh, verse 5. He said, um, and, uh, the holy city, the servants of God and the holy city will reign forever and ever. And it, but it's a new earth. It has this relationship between, this healthy relationship between people. And this is a promise that God's servants will reign forever and ever. And God will give them life. So how can we be involved? This, again, this is the, the idea that um, you know, God brings people to cities. And so there's a concept. So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, Tokyo. Um, it's an example of something called a primate city. Primate kind of means primary city. So basically, a, pr a city like Tokyo, it has more than double the population of any other city in the country. And so when I meet somebody who is from, let's say like the guy from Nigeria I met last night, I said, oh, you must be from Lagos. Lagos, Nigeria. And I was right. And then I meet some, like when, I, when I'm at LAX and I'm uh, paying the money for parking, and I meet somebody and they're from uh, Ethiopia. And I'll say, oh, you're from Ethiopia, or you're from Addis Ababa. And I'm right, usually. If I meet somebody from, uh, from England, I'll usually say, Oh, you're from England, or you must be from London. Okay, because London has uh, probably four or five times the population of any other city in the country. Sometimes these, these cities have half the population of the country is in one city. So the Tokyo area is 36 million. Uh, population of Japan, I think, is 120 million. So almost one third of the population of Japan is in the Tokyo area. Uh, other country, you think about a country like, uh, you know, meet somebody from Sweden. I say, oh, you're from Sweden, uh, you're from Stockholm. And I'm usually right. So that's a primate city. Uh, Denmark, what, what would you say? Anybody know Denmark? Copenhagen. Copenhagen, yeah. So Copenhagen is the capital, the largest city. Uh, Kenya. So, oh, you're from Kenya, you're from Nairobi. Um, uh, and South Korea? Where, is, where are most people from? Seoul. So those are all primate cities. So basically a primate city, it has the population that's at least double, but usually um, four or five times the population of any other city. It's also uh, sometimes up to 40 or 50 percent of the population of the country is in that one city. Um, and then it also has the, uh, the political power. So it might not be the capital, but it's got the most powerful people politically. Uh, it also has the best schools, so the National University, is huge. so the number one university in Tokyo is Tokyo National University. Uh, Taiwan, capital is Taipei, it has uh, the best university. Um, it also has the wealthiest people in the country are in the primate cities, the best place to live, it has the best shopping, the best, biggest shopping malls. So all of these things uh, mean that this city is pretty important. So when we meet international students, they're almost always from the primate city. Uh, they also they would have the best international schools. Uh, so, but not every country has a primate city. So the U.S. Uh, doesn't have one city that dominates. Does that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, so J Jakarta, I think, probably. Not. What do you think? Maybe not. Maybe. Yes, yeah, so it's a little bit fuzzy. It, I think the population doesn't dominate. Because so Surabaya is a big city, Bandung is a big city. Uh, but I don't know. But you can, you can debate. And even states of California, uh, of the U.S., have, have primate. So I would say Los Angeles is the primate city for California. So it has the political power, the uh, the uh, social capital, the best shopping, on and on and on. And it has a really big population if you count Southern California. And so, you know, why is this important? So in 1800, only 4% of the people of the world lived in cities. So that's 90% are living in the countryside, farming and, and living in villages. And 
the 1800s, there was a lot of industrial advance, industrial revolution, but still by 1900, only 14% of the people of the world lived in cities. So that's not that many, considering there was a lot of, of uh, technological advance. But by 2000, 47% of the people lived in cities. And by 2005, the 50% threshold was passed. And so it's predicted by 2030, 60% <clears throat> of the people of the world will live in cities. Uh, you look at China, and China has the greatest migration to cities of any country in the world by far. So that's like 200 million people in China have moved from the countryside to the city in the last uh, 10 years. And so you say, well, why, you know, why, uh, you know, is that significant? And when we look at Revelation, we say, yeah, you know, God is working through cities. And so this gathering of people in cities makes it easier for relationships to be restored. Because if people are living scattered all over the place, you can't have a relationship with them. Um, and then we look at, you know, our own, our own city, we talk about really Los Angeles County, and so uh, we say, well, that's, you know, what, is, what does that mean for Los Angeles? So did you know uh, that Los Angeles, if we count kind of the Southern California area, LA area, is the second largest Korean city in the world? And there's, there's Seoul, and then there's Los Angeles has the second highest population of Koreans. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so a lot of Koreans here. Second largest Filipino community or city in the world. So number one is Manila. Number two is Los Angeles. Anybody been to, to Glendale? Uh, West Covina. West Covina, a lot of, yeah. Uh, second largest Vietnamese community outside of, of, uh, of Saigon, right? <coughs> If you've been to, to Little Saigon, Westminster, actually Rosemead is up there too. A lot of in, in, uh, Vietnamese in Rosemead. And so this is a, so, so technically, because it's hard to define cities, so technically it's the largest Korean metropolitan area outside of Korea. So outside of the, 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 the country. Largest Filipino metropolitan area outside of the Philippines. Our largest uh, Vietnamese metropolitan area outside of Vietnam. And uh, same with uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, second largest. So this is true for 27 other countries. The Los Angeles area has this, the largest population outside of that, that uh, country. In fact, have you heard of Belize? Country of Belize, anybody know where it is? South, it's Central America. It's actually, yeah. Uh, so so uh, my brother's been there, so Belize, is a pretty small country in Central America. Is actually more Belizeans in California, Southern California, than there are in any city in Belize. So actually, the largest, the capital is called Belize City. There's more Belizeans here than in Belize City. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, you say, well, that's only in other countries, but there's actually more Canadians in Los Angeles than in Vancouver, British Columbia. So it's a lot of Canadians here. Uh, so anyway. You know, again, why is this why is this important? It's important in light of Revelation 22 that God. You say, why is you know is, this is bad that so many people are moving to cities? Because city cities produce what poverty. So a lot of people come to the cities to find jobs and migrate, and sometimes have trouble finding jobs and end up living in in uh, slums. Uh, in the city, there's a lot of religious pluralism, so you see a lot of mixing of different religions. Uh, you see a lot of, of mixing of, of uh, people from different ethnic groups, and sometimes that brings conflict. Uh, sometimes, a lot of times people don't want to live in the cities because they miss the, 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 uh, uh, the countryside and the, the, uh, uh, what, are the, what do people complain about in cities? Pollution, right? Creates pollution. Uh, but I always say I love pollution. It, it means there's, there's stuff going on. Uh, High cost of living in the cities, so it's much more expensive to live in cities. Um, but all that means that there's potential and place for God's people to serve and to help restore relationships. So again, that's what uh, when we talk about poverty, that's a, it's about broken relationships. And when we talk about uh, this, uh, people complaining about uh, conditions in the city, it's about the need for relationships to be restored. And 
And we say, well, what do we do with that? Um, and so, remember, this is talking about the servants of God. So what did the servants of God do? The servants of God need to be about relationships in the city. Uh, one of uh, the favorite ministries I've heard about, I actually heard this guy speak, and so he founded a ministry in Toronto, uh, Canada, which is a very, very diverse city. I'm hoping to go there someday because if anybody been to Toronto, there's a lot of Indians in Toronto, I've heard. A lot of everybody. And so um, part of the issue is when people move to cities, uh, they tend to live, not so much Los Angeles, but people tend to live in so-called eth ethnoburbs. Ethnoburbs. So suburb that has people of just one ethnic group. And this doesn't happen so much in uh, Southern California, I've noticed. Because, uh, there's such diversity. There's no majority culture. But in, in, uh, in, uh, in that, et that ethnic community could be in, uh, in this, within a, a city neighborhood. So uh, this guy I, I heard speak, uh, he founded a ministry called Move In. Move In. And so that ministry, basically, he finds a team of people, Canadians, and they move into an ethnic community right where a certain ethnic community is living and basically just love on them and serve them. So sometimes the issue is um, learning English, sometimes the issue is needing food, sometimes the issue is, is all of the things that, are, that, are, that come from a broken relationship. And that happens when people come from another country to the U.S. or come from the countryside of the U.S., they leave their relationships behind. And so uh, somebody who comes from uh, South Korea, for instance, uh, from Seoul, where they were living there, they had aunts and uncles around, they had family around, they had their church, and so then they come to Los Angeles and they move to Cerritos, let's say, and they've left all that behind. And so where, they, where did they go for relationship? Many South Koreans go to the church, and so that's where they have uh, the opportunity to have those relationships. But not every ethnic group has an opportunity to go to a church or a religious gathering. Uh, that's why the Muslims that I know come to the mosque, because then they have a relationship there, and they can, they, can, uh, they can get their needs met. There are servants there. And so there's a ministry called Move In, uh, people, a team moves into the city uh, wherever there's a community and they basically serve whatever it is, no agenda, just serving and being about restoring the relationships that uh, John is writing about here, kind of bringing about this, this vision of this new Jerusalem. And so it's pretty exciting because uh, a lot of times we think about you know, ministry or uh, uh, mission as being a program. You know, we're going to do this and this and this and here's the plan. And really what, what John is saying uh, in this is that it's about being a servant. And we learn about serving from Jesus. We say what, you know, uh, John 20, 21, uh, Jesus uh, uh, is quoted by John as saying, uh, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So just as God sent Jesus into the earth to serve, uh, Jesus is saying, we are sent in the same way to serve. And so, uh, and what does that mean? It means helping to restore relationships. It doesn't mean having a, necessarily mean have, it's not a bad thing to have a plan, but when I go into the mosque, when I go in to uh, meet somebody from a different culture, I'm just saying, how can I serve? How can I, uh, how can I be about restoring relationship with God and restoring relationship with others? So that's one of the things is about being a peacemaker. Um, and that's one thing I love about, uh, about being uh, in this in community with uh, people that are from all over the world because sometimes they don't get along with one another and so I can be a peacemaker. So even as a Christian in the mosque, I can uh, focus on helping bring peace and restoring relationships between people that are maybe not necessarily going to talk to one another. But they're always interested in me. Why, you know, why am I there? And uh, and it's really about relationship, relationship with God, relationship, helping to bring about peaceful relationship with one another. And uh, 
And really that's, uh, we, we hear with this kind of a goal, Micah 6, 8, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, he has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So that's really what, what uh, uh, Jesus is talking about, what we should do. And uh, one of the things, uh, again, I love to travel and to go to these huge cities um, because this opportunity to be about relationship. And uh, you've got to feel sorry for, for, uh, for my kids. Uh, so Hudson, you know, because he kind of stands out because he's, he's six to, Austin, he's up to 270 pounds now. Hudson, he bench presses 295. Oh. Oh. And his, uh, what's it called when you do the, the squat? <laughs> Uh, 540 pounds. Squat. I think it's sort of the deadlift. Deadlift, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I think it was a school record at Maranatha. You know? So, so, uh, so when, so I'm actually going to bring him to Japan with me next year, and he's going to kind of stand out, right? Being a 6'2, six, six 270 pound Asian American kid. Because actually, you can, they can, they can tell uh, uh, Americans. My, my Japanese friend kind of told me they can see Americans a mile away, like Asian Americans, because the posture is different, clothing is different. So my daughter, who was with me, I thought she would fit in, you know, because she's she's five feet tall and Chinese American, you know, and and uh, kind of uh, I thought she looked Japanese, but no, everybody could tell she was she was really American, but but Asian American, you know, because here uh, everybody assumes that. Like the Hudson's mom is, is Asian, you know, when we're together, but uh, but in Japan it's going to be pretty obvious. And so even uh, and so, but I look at it as an opportunity to be in relationship, to kind of initiate conversation. So I would I would sometimes look at the, the Japanese person and, uh, and say, "This is my daughter," and smile, and they would kind of uh, kind of look at me funny, right? Because in Japan, they're not used to even seeing an Asian Caucasian marriage, right? But because every in Japan, everybody marries Japanese. I'm not everybody, but it's pretty common. And so they would look at her, they they look at me, and look at her, and kind of <laughs> be embarrassed, right? But that's a chance to say, you know, that God made our family, that she's adopted. So I actually know the word for adoption in many languages because that's that's. About the relationship as well, and so you know, so that's part of, of uh, what I share is that you know, uh, say God makes families in many ways, and so we're all part of God's family, and it's not about biological relationship. You know, my daughter, I love her uh, just as much as if she were my biological daughter. In fact, I could argue, and this is tricky, but I would say maybe I love her more because when I look at her. And realize she does, you know, it's a, she's a complete gift from God, right? And even having five Asian kids, you know, I said, wow, you know, that's that's pretty surprising. But it's also uh, the fact that God, the family, and this is really what restoration is talking about. It's about being in the same family. So I often say, you know, we we can be in the same family. We can be in God's family as brothers and sisters in Christ, without being related biologically. And so that's really the message of the gospel, is this restoration relationship about being part of God's family. And who's the king? Who's the father? God, right? And so this is the message that I share, uh, even in the mosque. You know, I take out my, my phone sometimes, and I'll show them a picture of my family and, and, and kind of smile. And they'll kind of look at me, and, you know, it's kind of shocking, right, that I have... Asian, but this is this is really this is what John is talking about the restoration relationship. It's not about what family we're born into. It's about being part of God's family. And this is the this is the ultimate relationship relationship with God. And, and again, the exciting thing is that that is it's it's um, kind of restored. I think I told you before. Even in India is even more challenging because uh, in India the only uh, adoption is if you're. If your parents die and then you, you're raised by your aunt or aunt and uncle or something like that. And so I always think, I think I told you this before, but I, uh, you know, last time we were in India, 
I was, you know, I can speak pretty well, one of the Indian languages, and so I thought I was fitting in pretty well, and uh, and I thought they were staring at my daughter because she's Asian American, and uh, and my daughter said, no, no, Dad, they're staring at you because I've never heard a, uh, a white person speak speak Indian language, but I thought I was fitting in. So a lot of relationship I find is um, is language. So that's why I love to speak uh, Indonesian, Arabic. I think I, feel like I can speak 16 languages fluently, but only four or five words. But those words are fluent. So when I'm in the mosque, I can speak a little bit of Arabic, but fluently. And so that's part of relationship too. Is is the, is when somebody hears uh, language, then uh, then that's you know, the beginning. The question is why. How can how, why do you speak Arabic so fluently? Is the question not? I mean, they don't really say that, but but that's uh, but that's again a chance to talk about how much I love uh, being in a relationship with Muslim friends, and, and that, that we can be part of the same family. And so, uh, you know, when we look at at uh, ministry in the city and, and serving in the city, it's really about relationship. It's not about a program or making a plan, it's about being part of God's plan. And so again, you know, when we look at this passage, um, we look at, um, uh, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. So the Lamb is Jesus. Uh, and His servants will worship Him. So that's why worship is so important. That's why I love worshiping in many languages. And they will see His face. And this is just seeing the face of God. And so we this is why this passage is so important. Uh, his name will be on their foreheads. That means part of, remember, the Lamb's Book of Life. We can be written in the, uh, in the Book of Life. And night will be no more. So this is, this is, this is you know, exciting. This is, a, this is, there'll be no uh, light of lamp or sun. So this is the New Jerusalem. And so when we read Revelation, you know, all these images, but this is a picture of what it will be like. Uh, for the Lord God will be their light. And so this is the light of the gospel, and they will reign forever and ever. So this is the kingdom of God uh, reigning forever and ever. And so, uh, and when we look to the, to the last words of the Revelation, so the last words of the Bible, that's significant. So we go to Revelation 22.20. It uh, uh, says, He who testifies to these things says, and this is, this is Jesus saying, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. And then command, and, and we hear this a lot, come Lord Jesus. And so this is the excitement that, that Jesus is coming soon. Oops. And so, and then the last, the benediction, the whole Bible, the grace of Lord Jesus be with all. And so all means all. Not just the Gentiles, I mean not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And so this is something that I think is exciting, that we, we, we want to pray that uh, Jesus will come soon, and we want to be ready. And the way to be ready is to have relationships and to serve in the city. So, uh, so I think in the, uh, people say to me, you know, isn't it crowded in Los Angeles? Don't you hate the freeways and the, uh, the uh, pollution and all that? And I say, no, I love it. I love cities. I love crowds. I love people um, because I know as part of God's plan, God brings people to cities to me, and so I love that. So uh, I think we can be encouraged by this. I encourage you in, in the week ahead to read through Revelation, especially after uh, after verse after chapter four. And again, you don't need to understand it; just read it, or you can listen to it on you know, audio Bible. Just listen to Revelation, and I think sometimes we're afraid of it. Uh, but it, it is exciting, and it's talking about a new heaven, a new earth, and a new city. And so let's remember that and uh, to be thankful for all that God uh, is promising and to pray that uh, Jesus will come soon. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for Jesus who humbled himself and became a servant so that the living water could throw, flow to those in need. We desire to follow the example of Jesus in the city, use our gifts, 
our talents and our abilities as servants so that we can have a part in the restoration of these relationships and the healing of the nations. Uh, thank you especially for the opportunity to serve in cities, especially in our city. Uh, please help us to be humble and committed servants according to your plan and purposes that we may experience the joy that comes with doing your will and the joy that comes from worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen.